so uh, welcome to my talk on shaping clouds with Terraform and the idea is to kind of give you a, a whistle stop tour of t Terraform and how that might be useful for, for making clouds. Um, just to give you a sort of um, idea of me, I kind of give my pedigree if you will. Uh, so I've got a quite a bit of strong background in clouds. Uh, I'm certified on Google and Amazon. Uh, you'll notice particularly the big data, data engineer, data is kind of a thing for me. Um, and I've been involved in the open source community, particularly around Postgres for many years. I've contributed some code, uh, code to core Postgres, a lot of bug fixes to JDBC. Um, used to run a build farm member for the JDBC driver. Um, I've contributed to Terraform as well. I'm a returning speaker to Floss UK and a, another tool that probably nobody here has used or heard of called YAL, which is a workflow language, um, which is a, a Java tool. So um, the thing is, I, you know, I, I like to have the think that I, um, I know data. That's, you know, that's my thing. So this talk, we're going to look at what Terraform is, what the life cycle of using Terraform is. Um, we're going to develop a simple infrastructure in Google Cloud as we go along. Now I've chosen Google Cloud simply because everybody else seems to like using Amazon as an example. I didn't choose Azure because it's Azure. Um, so, all right. Um, and then we'll just look at some of the ways we can improve from a very basic uh, setup that we, we establish. So Terraform itself. Firstly, as an idea, how many people have heard of Terraform? Most of you, that's pretty cool. How many of you are using Terraform? Most of the same people, cool. So uh, it's open sourced. Um, it's from HashiCore, which have created quite a lot of lovely tools for us. Um, first released back in July 2014. Um, the boss of the company that I worked for, uh, he had a conversation with, um, uh, I can't remember his first name, but Hashimoto uh, himself and gave the genesis of the idea of Terraform, which is kind of something like CloudFormation that doesn't suck. Um, Current version is 11.7. Um, this, they go through things fairly quickly. Um, I don't know if version one will ever happen, really. You kind of just ignore the zero. Um, breaking changes generally increment the middle number there, um, but not always so. Um, it's written in Go, which is pretty fantastic because you get, um, you can run this on a lot of different platforms. That's quite useful for people like us where we, I do have people who do work with Azure uh, and sort of running Windows rather than Linux. So it's you know, nice to have a tool that can just run most anywhere and simply Terraform.io to get it. So there's a life cycle to using this tool. You go through defining your infrastructure, planning uh, a, a deployment, um, well, I skipped initializing there, but you initialize before you plan, uh, you apply your changes, and then eventually at some point in time, usually iterating through initialize plan and apply many, many times, you get to a point where you're going to destroy your infrastructure. So defining your infrastructure, it's just text files. Uh, you have a collection of files with a TF extension in a single directory. And you can do everything in a single file if you want. You can split it across many files. Terraform will just simply look at the director, directory it's running in and pull it all together uh, and build a plan. Uh, you can express this in either the HashiCore language Terraform um, or Strangely, you can do it in JSON if you really, really want to. Um, see previous comment about uh, CloudFormation. Um, Essentially, your configuration is declaration of a number of providers, uh, resources, and data sources that are going to deliver what you're hoping to, to get. So, providers, they expose a collection of programmable resources and data sources. Um, it's kind of, well, it's done as a plugin now, this wasn't always the case, but uh, you have a core Terraform which has all this logic to do with planning and applying and so on, and then you have these providers that attach in and actually do the interaction with your target platform. And there's quite a variety. There's 73 that HashiCore directly maintain themselves. Uh, these range from the major cloud offerings um, through the sort of um, smaller cloud offerings like Heroku, um, even SaaS, uh, PagerDuty, that's one we use quite a bit. 
Um, you can even manage some software setups. Uh, I've highlighted the fact that Isinga 2 is on here because there's quite a few people from the Isinga community here. Uh, my beloved Postgres is there as well and something else. Um, and then there's some mis miscellaneous ones that are more for manipulating what you're doing in Terraform um, and can also be useful as a kind of intermediary stage, particularly uh, sort of no local and uh, null ones. You can do some interesting kind of manipulation. But um, beyond that, there are quite a handful of community providers. Uh, so these aren't maintained by HashiCorp, and uh, so some of these are, are better than others. Um, we have Kafka and Helm, that's kind of on the software side. Um, Google Calendar, that's, that's kind of a fun one to play with. Um, and you can write your own or fork uh, a provider, uh, and that's actually very, very useful. So uh, a lot of these platforms, they're developing at a pace. Uh, many of them are not directly working with Terraform, so you, new features are available that Terraform doesn't know how to deal with. Um, a project I did a sort of year or so ago, we needed to do quite a lot of stuff with Cloud SQL 2 in Google. Uh, Terraform didn't have support for what we wanted to do. It's far faster at that point to just fork what was there, add the functionality that we needed because we had 22 days to do this project, uh, and then all that's been uh, contributed back to the community. That's a bit of a slower process, but at least for that point in time for our you know, quick solving problem, great, we can fork this, we can still use Terraform. Some point down the line, we can get that commu uh, committed back into uh, the general community and uh, you know, just stop using that provider. So Google Cloud Provider. This simple declaration here is that all my examples are going to be in HCL, unsurprisingly. Um, we specify, um, well, in fact, all these fields are actually optional. You just can just declare provider Google, and it can infer everything from environment variables if you're using things like gcloud off um, in the background. Um, just an idea, how many people are familiar with Google Cloud's sort of setup and offering? Not too many, so I'll try not to be assume too much knowledge then when I'm talking about Google Cloud. Uh, for the most part, a lot of the terminology does map to AWS if you're more familiar with, with that. Um, I think they've been, Google have been fairly good at trying to do that just to kind of help people get up to speed with their platform faster. So um, one big difference is uh, Google's authentication mechanism is quite different than AWS's. So that's you know, immediately we're, we're moving away. Um, you have this idea of um, service accounts. Uh, so you can go into a project in Google. You can create a service account. You can download a credentials file. Uh, and that basically you know, lets you in. Now you can integrate it with um, two-factor authentication and so on to get you know, decent security around that. So you just don't have some magic JSON file sitting around that if somebody gets hold of that, they can do whatever you want in your infrastructure. Um, but, uh, and you can also tweak the amount of privileges that has. So you can uh, create a service role that can only provision uh, compute resources, for example, or uh, one that does have the ability to provision anything and everything. Um, so what we've done here is we've said, take the credentials from this file. We're going to use this project in Google. And uh, we're going to default to this particular region, which is the uh, UK region. Um, so we've got a provider, great, we're going to use some Google stuff, but how do we use that? This is what uh, resources are for. So they declare what should exist, and I think that's quite important to highlight. This is a declarative paradigm. Uh, so this is you know, we've got variants to say something like Ansible, where it's going to you know, go through a series of things and attempt to do what it can. Um, you can do a declarative Ansible if your backends are all appropriate, but not necessarily. Um, this is you know, declarative. So you're saying, this is what my infrastructure should look like. Um, We'll get on in a little bit to how it achieves that, um, but for the purpose of when you're, you're writing and designing this, this is your end target, is what you are writing. The available resources are determined by the provider you use. Uh, it's worth highlighting that they made a very conscious decision that uh, not to try and abstract 
things. So you don't have this kind of cloud abstraction layer where you talk about uh, virtual machines or um, network access rules or, or, or the such things. Uh, if you write something that uses AWS provider and it creates AWS infrastructure, you can't just simply change the provider and suddenly it's going to stand up the equivalent in Google. Um, you, you do actively have to choose what you're doing and write it so. Um, there's a general sort of naming pattern, so when you are looking at uh, some configuration files, you can see which resources are coming from which provider, and that's just simply provider underscore resource. So uh, it helps make this stuff a lot more readable rather than kind of going, oh, well, uh, I can't remember if that's you know, Google, that's AWS, because you can actually have multiple providers and stand up two sets of infrastructure at the same time if you really wanted to. Um, each resource will require a number of arguments to configure, and once it exists, it will give a number of attributes for you to, to consume in other resources. So, example of this here, we've got, um, we're gonna create a Google Compute Network called Skynet. Um, the resource type here is, so we'll guess the resource keyword to say we are creating a resource. We've got a type here, which is Google Compute Network. And so with Google, all your resources have that Google at the start. Um, generally, Compute is the kind of subset of the Google platform. So um, Google Storage is another one. Uh, and then the final one is a name that you're going to use internally in uh, the, the Terraform configuration to make reference to this. That's independent of the name that you see on the next line there because that's the name that Google will use inside its infrastructure to refer to your resource. So if you were to say go into the Google console and look at the infrastructure, you would see that there's a network named Skynet. Uh, now, of course, that could be the same, but they, they needn't be. Um, in this particular resource, there's quite a few other optional arguments that you can use. Uh, name is the only one that's mandatory. Everything else is uh, optional. So, next thing we might want to do is create a, a subnetwork inside our network here. Uh, carve ourselves out a CIDR block, uh, declare a region where we're going to put that, um, but we've got to link that to a resource. A subnetwork has to exist within a network. Now, we can reference using this interpolation uh, syntax of dollar braces. Um, and we just use the resource type dot the name that we used, followed by the actual attribute. And in most of the Google ones, it's a self-link, it's a URI. Um, so you can see we're starting to build up uh, pieces of our, our infrastructure here. We've got a, a network, we've got a subnetwork, and we can go on and on and on. Uh, what's interesting to note is that many resources require other resources to exist before you can actually start creating things. Um, what's often the easiest way to approach these is, uh, you know, if, you, if you're thinking of, you know, get, I want a bunch of compute instances, is to actually take the definition of a compute instance and work your way sort of backwards. So you can look in this and see, well, it needs a, a subnetwork. Uh, we've already created that, great. It needs to exist in a zone, uh, which if, um, that's an availability zone, so it's yeah, the same, okay. Um, and an image, which if you're, it's kind of like an AMI, it's just simply called an image in Google land. And that's it. Some resources require quite a lot more pieces and you can kind of look at Google's catalog and expect there to be a sort of one-to-one -one mapping with Terraform. Now there are also resources unique in Terraform to handle some of the linkages. Uh, so some of those you have to discover purely by working your way through from where you want to get to, back to all your prerequisites. Um, now, you can find this out by running this. You could just try and define something, see what happens, um, and you know, fix what breaks. So um, for, for us to get to a compute instance, we need to move on, get ourselves a zone, and get ourselves uh, an image. So the next category of things in Terraform is data sources. Now these are sort of declarations that allow you to fetch things programmatically from, uh, say, Google's APIs in our case here, but obviously other platforms. Um, or we can do some computation inside some of these, these data sources. So it's a, an interesting way to combine things 
um, if given that we're not working within a programming you know, language here, it's a configuration. Essentially, it's a read-only view to existing data, um, and it allows us to avoid hard coding some things. So we could look at Google's documentation and work out that there are three zones in Europe West 2, and they're currently A, B, and C. Uh, it's interesting to note that in some of Google's zones, the A no longer exists, but a D does. Um, so you can see that having a hard-coded list over time becomes a problem. Um, so we can do things like work out what zones are available in a region and uh, we can also determine the images that we can use for our compute instance. So to find the zones in the region, uh, we'll just use this Google Compute Zones, very similar declaration to a resource, we're saying data to Google Compute Zones, we're going to simply refer to it as zones, uh, naming I'm not particularly imaginative with. Um, and we're saying that we want to know in this region, Europe West 2, and we also want to give a status of up. Um, that's completely optional. You could get a full list, which would include ones that are down. Um, generally, they're up, but it's useful to know that if you're doing something at a point in time, you can stand something up and know that you're only going to be hitting things that are available and not fail because the zone, the target zone, will happen to be down when you execute it. Uh, so, referencing them is a little bit different. We have to have the data spec uh, keyword at the front, but then it follows the same pattern of resource, a type, a name, and then the target attribute. Unsurprisingly, the image one is very, very similar. Uh, now, in Google, the way that they handle um, these machine images is slightly different. You get this idea of an image family. So you can say Debian 9, Ubuntu, 1710, there's lots of different ones that are available from Google, and of course you can create your own families. Uh, but the idea is that you can make use of a family and take the latest version that's in that family, rather than specifically pulling out an individual one saying, I want that. So this is a nice little um, layering on top of a just collection of operating system images. Um, now, I'm making reference to a project that's external to my account, uh, but it's publicly open, so I'm able to effectively probe this and get to this machine image. Uh, and in the background, it will go and pull out uh, the latest Ubuntu 1710 image for me to use. Uh, again, self-link is how we're going to refer to it. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that's in there, like the size of the boot disk and all kinds of other funky things that could be interesting in some circumstances. And so we can finally create our uh, Google Compute instance. So um, we're going to declare what zone it's going to be in. Now note that there is a kind of array syntax here. So zones could return one, it could return many, uh, and I'm just going to pull out the first zone from that list. Um, I'm going to give it a name of T800, pick a machine type. Uh, this is kind of your equivalent of a, a T2 micro in Amazon land. Um, I'm going to give it, say that the boot disk is going to use that image that I found from my data source and I'm going to put it in the subnetwork that we created earlier. So that's great. I've now configured a whole bunch of um, pieces, well, a subnetwork, a network, and a, a compute instance, but nominally I now have a, a configuration, so what do I do with that? So Terraform init is our sort of first real interaction with Terraform, the binary itself. And what this does is it prepares our environment to actually execute. So it will validate that our configuration is sane. So if we've got syntax errors, typos, whatever, uh, it will highlight this to us right now, uh, and fail immediately and say, hey, you, you screwed up here. It will pull down the providers that you've declared. Um, and you can, you can lock that down if you need to so that you don't necessarily pull in the latest, greatest for long-lived projects. That's actually quite useful to do. Um, and it, populates a .terraform directory with all the goods that it's, it's pulling down. So if we run Terraform in it, apologies that that's very, very small, but it, uh, quite informative is really what I want to get to there. Uh, we see that it's pulling down 1.10.0 of the, the Google provider, and uh, it now tells us that it's, it's initialized. So our environment is now ready. It's happy that our configuration files are syntactically correct. Uh, we've got the provider that we need, we only needed one, uh, we're ready to go. 
So the next step is to make a plan. Um, so the plan determines exactly what needs to be done. So this is back to where I said about um, it being declarative. Now the way it achieves this is it looks at what you're saying in your configuration. It, there's a state file, which I'll talk about a lot more a little bit later, um, but this is essentially what it saw the last time it ran. So at this point in time where we've just created our stuff, there is no state, so we know that there's nothing that we expected previously. And it will then look at your intended target and determine what actually is there. Uh, so between these three different statuses, it builds up a directed acyclic graph of the changes that it needs to make in your infrastructure, um, and it will output a plan confirming what will happen. Um, now that uh, directed acyclic graph comes in handy because you are immediately forced not to have circular dependencies anywhere. This flushes out anything like that. Uh, so if, if Terraform finds that you've done that while it's building it up, it'll say, sorry, I can't apply this, there's a loop, uh, and it usually tells you pretty accurately where that uh, has occurred. So um, again, plan is quite a, a verbose sort of output, uh, but what it will give you at the end here under those uh, dashed lines is a list of the, the actions. Now we're only creating things, so you can also see destroying, modifying, in place, replacing, um, and uh, so it's using a plus to denote. Uh, and uh, I've you know, chopped quite a bit out there, but we can see some of the things we declared, some of the values are being computed. Um, we've got our, our networks here. Um, and uh, there's a key thing I missed when I specified the command. Um, I have specified, I haven't just simply run Terraform plan here, I specified minus out to put the plan into a, a file. Now you can run plan and not save the output. It'll give you a warning to say, well, this is the plan I would have done at this point in time. Uh, that's not to say if I plan again, it'll be the same because you maybe have somebody tweaking and making manual changes in the infrastructure. And so the plan might be different the second time round. But uh, it's usually quite useful to, to save your plan because you know, this is where I want to be. Uh, so the, um, oh no, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. So once we've got our plan, we see it saved it uh, to my plan there, and it also tells us what we need to do to actually apply that plan. So Terraform Apply actually makes the changes. So this is going to go and talk to Google and tell it to create our network subnetwork and uh, our compute instance. Um, if you haven't provided it a plan, it will actually go and run plan right there and then uh, and will prompt you to say, do you want me to apply this? Enter yes. This can take anywhere from a second to, to many minutes. Um, some resources like a CloudFront distribution in AWS that can take upwards to half an hour to provision. Um, things like uh, second generation Cloud SQL databases, usually if, if you've got a master and a slave, uh, you're looking usually around 10 minutes for the master to provision and then a subsequent 10 minutes for the slave to provision. Um, so you can get some coffee. Um, Changes are then written to a state file. Uh, the default is terraform.tf state, and this then forms your point in time to look at for the subsequent um, planning and applying. It's simply a, a JSON document of the infrastructure as it existed when Terraform finished executing. If there's already a state file, it will just write a dot backup, so you can at least have two. Now, this can be particularly useful if your credentials expire mid-run. Um, because you can then be in a very strange state where some things have created, some things haven't, um, and you might need to do some, some manual repairing, but uh, that's, that's an exercise for the reader. So running our apply, we can see that it's going to create our network. It stands to reason that was the first thing it needed to do, followed by the sub subnetwork. Um, this didn't take particularly long, uh, about 12 seconds to create the, the Skynet network. Uh, 10 sec no, 14 seconds to do um, the subnetwork and 13 seconds to do. So we're looking at about 30 seconds to get a compute instance stood up in Google Cloud with Terraform. Um, so 
at the end we get a little summary there to say that three were added, zero were changed, and zero were destroyed, and that matches what we were, were expecting based on the plan. So um, we got Skynet and we've got our T-800. So moving beyond that kind of very basic setup of just creating a handful of resources and uh, you know, working with our local files and, and so on, and the likelihood is you want other people to be working on this infrastructure, uh, not likely to be flying solo, um, you can use a, a backend. Uh, this is all how Terraform manages your state files. The default is local, so if you don't specify anything, it'll just use your local directory and uh, you, you get a state file. You could put this in version control, um, but you can get into some fun messes where somebody applies a change, then commits it to um, the repository. Meanwhile, you've, you've planned and applied a change and you've got all kinds of cross wires, mess, horrible. Um, so there's quite a few different ones available. Um, all of the sort of cloud providers, their uh, buckets can be used as a backend. Um, there's a, a console backend, so you can actually just store the state in console itself, uh, etc. D, uh, if you're in the Kubernetes land. Um, now the buckets, they are fantastic because all of these have the ability when you create a bucket to uh, specify that they should be versioned. So you get uh, automatic backups of your state file just by virtue of using a versioned bucket. Uh, and that can be, be interesting because you can look back potentially through multiple versions and see where changes were being made. So uh, we'll you naturally use a, a Google Cloud bucket here for ours. Now, the bucket has to already exist. Uh, so you, you could create the bucket inside your uh, configuration here uh, and then move to a backend um, that uses that bucket. But uh, generally, we kind of say, no, put your bucket somewhere else. In fact, this is one of the few manual pieces of infrastructure we happily create because you almost don't want this bucket being managed by Terraform because if somebody runs a destroy, you could take out your state bucket. Um, now, backend gets initialized before everything else. So uh, because we're using Google, even though we've got a Google provider, which had our credentials, our project in our region, we actually need to specify them again. Uh, and we can't use any interpolation here. Um, so we've got to hard code our, our bucket, but uh, this is, the one place where that, that um, is true. Now, with what we've already done, if we now just run Terraform in it, it will actually detect that we've changed the back end for, uh, from local to the Google uh, bucket, uh, we confirm that that's what we, we want to do. Is this really what we intended? Uh, we say, yes, that's great. It will simply go off, move that state into the bucket, and uh, we'll then carry on checking provider plugins and, and so on. So as you might expect, given that I had, there's an interpolation syntax, I made references to pieces that we used in other resources, that there is support for variables. Um, declaration is much the same as most of these other things, it's a variable keyword. Um, you can declare your values explicitly or you can leave them undefined effectively. And when you run a plan, you'll get prompted uh, to supply those values. You can also stick them in a file called terraform.tfvars. This is just simply a name value uh, sort of set. Uh, and if plan sees that that file's there, it will take the values from there. And if you've missed any, you'll get prompted. You can also override individual variables on the command line if necessary. Uh, and you can also put your variables in a file other than terraform.tfvars if you so choose. Uh, you've got, um, I can't count, actually four types of variables, though I say three, and I do list four, string, boolean, list, and uh, map. So here we are, we've got a variable, we give it a name. Uh, I'm saying that the default for this is Europe West 2. Uh, there's a, a type. Now, Terraform will infer the type based on the value you give it. Um, if you don't give it a default value, then particularly for things that aren't strings or booleans, uh, you'll, you'll need to declare that this is a list because otherwise it'll accept a string, think that you're using a string and likely where you're then using a list, it'll complain. Um, and description, you can give um, 
kind of commentary on what the purpose of this variable is. Uh, some of the uh, tools that make a use of something called modules, which we'll touch on a bit later, can actually take that and form some of the documentation. Um, so use descriptions, just like commenting your code. Uh, and uh, unsurprisingly, interpolation, var dot region. So this is how we get to uh, the value in that, that variable. So maps and lists aren't that much different. Uh, very familiar syntax from most anything else you're, you've used. A uh, list is just simply an array of values and uh, a map, we just use curly braces, uh, key value pairs. Um, to reference a list, we've got the you know, standard array syntax um, and we also can use a string value in that same array syntax to do um, a lookup on the map. Um, this sort of map, not a particularly great example now that data sources exist, but um, in the, the sort of older versions, pre-10, I think, um, you would have these kind of lists listing all your different regions and the images that you might use, uh, and then you might use that region variable we declared on the previous slide to uh, pull in the, the, the particular image you want to use. Uh, but as I say, data sources get rid of that sort of um, thing. So if we take what we had, we can now, everywhere we had Europe West 2, we can just simply replace it with var region. Um, so now by changing the value of that parameter, perhaps on the command line running plan, we can now stand this up in any region um, that we wish to. Um, no changes, um, just, just a variable. Um, one really nice thing about the way that uh, variables work is that you can actually make these changes, run a plan, and see that you haven't actually broken anything. Um, so if you create a bunch of stuff, realize that actually this is useful to extract as a variable, you can very, very safely do that with confidence and see that you haven't introduced something unexpected. So beyond that, we have an idea of modules. So it's a collection of resources and or data sources um, that we can write ourselves. Um, it accepts a bunch of arguments, much like a, a resource would, and it provides uh, a whole pile of attributes. Uh, we specify a source to locate it. This can be a local directory, or it can even be a Git repository. And you can specify a tag or a revision of that repository to pull that down. Um, there is also recently uh, community modules, um, registry.terraform.io. So there's a bunch that HashiCorp have put on, uh, we at Clarinet have put a, a number on, uh, and that's, that's sort of growing. So there's quite a lot of sort of things uh, that you might want to do. If you have a look at the modules, either there'll be something there that you can just take, use, run, uh, or it might, particularly if you're not too familiar with either the provider or um, Terraform itself, it's a fantastic repository of examples of how you, you can achieve things. So to write a module, it's just a bunch of configuration files in a directory. There's nothing more special to it than that. All the variables that you have are considered arguments. If you provide a value, um, it's you know, ready to use. If you don't, uh, it's a mandatory argument. Um, once you've created it, it gives you attributes exactly the same. So the way we provide it out, though, is we have this output syntax, which gives that, that path. So externally, we'll refer to it as Skynet subnet, um, but internally, it's that same string we were using previously. So we can extract our compute network, our compute subnetwork, a couple of variables. So we want to uh, make the name mandatory, the CIDR range um, mandatory. We're going to let the, the region default to Europe West 2, and we're going to output the, the self-link from the subnetwork so that somebody can actually use this. So to make use of the module, we just simply module, give it a name, we tell you, you know, where it is. So this is a directory called GCP network in the same place that I was already running this. Um, I provide the mandatory uh, input arguments and I just change the one location where I was using that uh, to make the module network subnetwork uh, and that will give me the self-link to the subnetwork created inside the module. 
Now, we do need to run in it again because in the background, Terraform will pull down either from Git or make a kind of local copy of that directory into the .terraform folder um, and make sure that that module is syntactically correct. So if you, you know, pull down a bum version, uh, Terraform will reject it and say, sorry, this, this doesn't work. Um, so we can, you can sort of see how you can kind of go from there and start building kind of uh, larger and larger building blocks for standing up uh, your infrastructure. Uh, but also if you're kind of doing this time and time again, like we do for lots of different clients, uh, we've got a bank of things. So we don't have to go through creating networks and subnetworks and, and so on every time. We just pull the module, specify a couple of parameters, bang, we're done. So going through our init plan apply, eventually it's time to get rid of what we created. So uh, we're going to destroy our infrastructure and it will remove everything that it, it knows about. Um, it will done, it does a plan. This is a different plan, but internally it will plan and identify, I'm going to destroy these things. It will prompt you to say, you know, are you sure you type? Yes. Um, and so it, there's sort of no circumstances where you need to run in it. If you've already run in it here. So we run Terraform Destroy. It comes up with our summary here and says that uh, there are three things we're going to destroy. Uh, nothing to add, nothing to change, three to destroy. So we enter a value of yes. And um, oh, this projector can't, isn't animating it particularly well. Oh, well. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> um, so, yeah. We can see that uh, our T800 instance was destroyed, uh, Skynet was destroyed, and uh, you know the world's a better place. So beyond the basics, um, you can use multiple backends. Um, this can be very useful so that you can um, use the same configuration files multiple times. So you could you know, stand up something in Europe West 2, exactly the same thing in Europe West 1. Um, you're just changing the parameters and you're changing the backend that this is targeting. Um, state files can also be data sources. So you can start layering things and uh, kind of creating stacks. Um, and you can uh, sort of use this to separate persistent items like the state bucket from more disposable items. Uh, and this can be very useful, particularly uh, in the early stages of a project where perhaps every night you tear everything down, firstly, because you're saving costs, you don't have infrastructure existing uh, for no reason when nobody's using it, but it also forces that on the flip side, when everything comes back up, did it come back up the way you anticipated? Uh, so it's a great way to you know, test this, but some things you don't want to destroy, like uh, an Am Amazon Elastic IP. Uh, if you free up an Elastic IP, when you get it back, it's going to be a different IP address. And that could be problematic if you've got external fire firewalls and um, so on. Uh, so to give you an idea of um, what the sort of tree structure might look like, you could have a stack that you're kind of calling app application and another one for global, um, one for some modules and uh, a region and a bunch of Terraform files uh, with helpful names to kind of indicate the kind of resources that you have in there. I would shy away from having a mammoth file because it just gets very difficult to find. Uh, even if there's only a single resource, like maybe in buckets, yeah, maybe there's two buckets in there, for example. Um, it just helps navigate your way around, makes it a lot easier to, to find things. So a few sort of worthy mentions beyond, um, there's a concept of provisioners. This allows you to, to do things. Chef is uh, one that's sort of tightly integrated, uh, but you can also do uh, uh, remote execution. So you can create a compute instance and then perhaps run Ansible on uh, that target. Um, there's a project that we have called Terrafile. Uh, so this is a way of specifying all the different modules uh, hooking up to the sort of GitHub. Because one of the problems you might get if you get a particularly large infrastructure, you might be using the same module many, many times, uh, and you've got to pull it down 15 times. So you run a, a plan, and, well, sort of an init, and it, it will, because it thinks it's a different one, it will pull it down each time. We can work around that with uh, Terrafile by declaring everything once, referencing that from inside the Terraform, so we're using our source to a sort of local path, but letting Terrafile uh, keep those modules up to date. Um, and TFN is another very useful tool for handling running multiple versions of Terraform. So in the background, you just create a .tfn file in your folder, um, specify the version of Terraform. Uh, that can be a, a range of versions as well. Um, and then in, 
providing this is in your sort of a uh, bash environment you can switch between projects and you know that you're running the right version of terraform and not inadvertently try and upgrade from 10 to 11 or something like that so just to summarize terraform's life cycle is the init plan apply iterate eventually destroy uh, make use of data sources and, invar and uh, variables to be as generic as possible. Um, make use of the remote backends uh, and many backends. Firstly, because you get, particularly if you're using version buckets, uh, a sort of backup facility for free. Um, but you also get a, a much higher level of reusability. And use modules to save time. You know, just kind of cut, cut and paste building blocks. Um, so that's kind of all I'm going to sort of say on that. Um, Clarinet's also hiring. I'm obliged to say that, so you can talk to me about that if you want. Uh, happy to take questions now, and uh, feel free to come and ask me anything Terraform um, through the rest of the conference. So. Uh, so about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, any questions? Oh, I have one. What testing strategies do you use? That's a really good question. Um, I should know the answer because we have one and I can't think what the tool's called now. Um, but essentially it's a, it's not Ruby. I think it's a Python script. So we've, we've modules that we've published, there are tests with them um, to validate. So you just kind of run it in a test harness, you see what the plan should be and, and validate that, that um, output. But I can't for the life of me remember what the tool's called now. I'll uh, let you know. Where, where I work at the moment, we uh, are standing infrastructure up with Terraform, and the thing we're struggling with is we we can send them do manual tests, but then how do you do the sort of end-to-end -end testing for your actual infrastructure you've stood up? So that's the sort of piece we haven't quite found a good tool for yet. So you, your infrastructure in Terraform, or you've, you've made changes to Terraform, you've got live infrastructure. How do you test it before you apply? Oh, okay, yeah, that's sort of a, a different problem to what I'm thinking of. So what we've done is we've got an ability to, to make sure that a module is going to do what it, it says, which isn't, if you have nothing but a kind of collection of modules, that's okay, because you can sort of know in isolation that each of these are going to do the intended. But um, certainly there are scenarios where you run a plan, the plan looks good, you make the apply, and it fails in some strange way, maybe because um, you've got, a name that uses characters that are not valid. Um, there's a, a, actually quite a, a discrepancy between the quality of some of the providers. Um, AWS, the pr provider, does a lot of pre-validation. Google, not so much. Um, Google tends to let the API do the validation, and so you don't know until the po point of time that you run whether you're going to hit um, a problem like that, and uh, you get the dreaded message of Terraform does not roll back in the um, face of errors, um, is the, the message that you see. Um, no, it's a, it's a problem. Uh, we don't have a, a great solution for it um, either, other than to have multiple environments and progress, uh, essentially promote a Terraform change up. Um, so by making use of the multiple backends, we can say in a development type environment, uh, make the change, see what happens there, get confidence that that's going to work. Uh, another sort of testing environment, expecting not to have to make any changes. And then finally, uh, against production, where we should be very confident where it's not going to make anything other than what we intended. Yeah. No. No, there isn't. Uh, within the tool itself, there's lots of uh, tests for making sure that the, what the tooling is doing is correct. Uh, as I say, there's some stuff around modules, but no, not for actually taking the plan and, and testing that in isolation. But since there is no rollback, how do you usually remediate when you know, plan goes okay and then you apply in the space somewhere, somewhere in the middle? How do you do it? Sometimes it's a case of. Uh, if you get an error, like the, the name example I gave there, uh, it's a case of making a quick tweak, doing a new plan, and another apply. Um, sometimes there can be sort of race conditions in some resources um, where your security groups in Amazon are great for doing this, where you're making, you might be removing a rule and adding a very similar rule. Um, and so it successfully removes the rule, uh, the rule and then fails to add it because uh, it 
it thinks the other one's still there. You kind of get this strange kind of race, race condition. Uh, you run another plan and the same apply, and it then runs uh, straight through. Um, really, at, at this point, it is that kind of good practice of running it multiple times, and so having a development infrastructure that's identical to a production infrastructure, uh, and getting confidence that that's going to do what you, in you intend. Um, now, if people have been making manual changes, you can still hit problems that you didn't and couldn't foresee uh, beforehand. So that, that's an area for Terraform growth. Any other questions? Yeah. I wonder where you think Terraform is going. Um, it's journey towards one point of and, and, and maybe if that's the point you think it should go. Um, so as an outsider to HashiCore, um, I get worried every time they do something around their, their kind of offerings. So Terraform Enterprise uh, has just kind of reincarnated under a new version. I've not really looked too much at it. Um, and, and of course, you know, I understand that as a business, they have to exist. Uh, I would prefer them to take more of an approach like the Postgres guys do, where you know, a charity owns the code, and there's lots of consulting firms around, and they make their money off professional services and uh, you know, development. Um, but uh, um, uh, sometimes called faux open sources and faux pas um, is always kind of a, a worry to me. So um, on the flip side, to date, They've been very, very good. So it's kind of, well, that's how you guys make your money. As long as the core open source tool does what we need it to do, I'm, I'm happy. Um, I think the, the providers need a lot of uh, work. Uh, I mentioned the discrepancies there between the AWS and the Google. That's just one of maturity. The Google one is playing catch up. Uh, Google do have people actually actively working on it. Um, uh, and I think some of this, this testing is, is a piece. Um, I think also um, this kind of rolling back and not rolling back in the face of errors. Um, the APIs, many of them do offer facilities to do sort of changes. Uh, and it would be nice to see that sort of fed back in. Um, but uh, I think this is a good, healthy community and uh, they, they do listen. So uh, as long as that keeps up, I think we, we can control where Terraform goes as much as they do. Okay. Thank you.